but who share in a heavenly calling. Now, hold on a second. Doesn't the author of Hebrews know who he's talking to? These people were worshiping angels. These people were drifting back to Judaism. These people did not understand, even begin to understand, the level of glory that Christ deserved. These people were making all kinds of mistakes, both theologically and in practice. They were getting a lot wrong. And it's these people that he calls holy brothers. Listen, dear church, one of the clearest things in the New Testament is that we should have a far bigger net of who we call brothers and sisters than we have traditionally. In, in the book of 1 Corinthians, for instance, Paul calls these people holy, set-apart brothers of the Lord, and then goes on for 15 chapters, more than that, to criticize them for being immature, for not even understanding that only one God exists, had far less understanding than we have today, and yet they were holy, and they were brothers. It's connected to what he just said in chapter 2, verse 11, which, when he said, that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. We should read that with shock, asking why? Why in the world is Christ not ashamed to call me a brother? Why in the world is Christ not ashamed to invite us around his table? This is a question that all of us should be asking when we read this passage. What's certainly being asked by those who read it in the first century, and that we, stepping into their shoes, should be reading it as now. This is a radical statement about identity. There has been a seismic shift in the identity of who these people are. Once, they were unholy. Once, they were lost. Once, they were living in sin. But now, they are holy. Once, they were strangers, but now they are brothers and sisters. Welcome to the table of the Lord. The fact that they are holy, and that we are called holy brothers with a heavenly calling, is not a statement that we are perfect, but it's a statement telling us that who we are now is different. It's like when, it's like when a parent gets on to a child and says something like, you're a Zerang. That's not how Zerangs act. That's a common thing that all parents do at some point. You're a fill-in-the-blank. You're a Zerang, is what I heard. That is not the way Zerangs act. What is, what is the parent doing in that situation? They are appealing to the child's truest identity. They're reminding the child who they are. That no matter what they have done, no matter what they have seen, no matter what they've experienced or the pain that they have caused, who they are is unchanging. Who they are is a part of this family, always, no matter what. That nothing can take them out of the hand of this family. Nothing can remove that last name from them. That who they are is a part of that family. And of course, one of the main ways the Bible speaks to us about our behavior is this sort of thinking. Where God says, you are Christ. You have been indwelt with the Spirit of God. You know the Father and have been made holy by the Father. Who you are is holy, even when you're unholy. Who you are is a brother of Christ, even when everything points to that not being true. That old self, that old life, that old way of living, those sinful things is not who you are anymore. You belong to Jesus. Into a culture that is scrambling right now for identity. To identify themselves as something. If you are hearing my voice today and you have bowed to Christ, no matter your mistakes or your failures, no matter your successes or your wins, you must remember who you are at the bottom. At the bottom, you are God's. And it is His name that is on you for now and forevermore. That's your true identity. That's who you are. You are holy brothers. And the extension of that is that you are holy brothers who share in a heavenly calling. This is still a statement about Identity. Uh, Paul, who either writes this or someone's probably referencing, Paul uses this phrase very often in the New Testament. He's the only person in antiquity that we know that uses it. And, and the word actually is the heavenlies. You have a calling from the heavenlies. You are from the heavenlies. The idea is that you are not from here. That is, your citizenship lies elsewhere. That you are a citizen of a heavenly country. 
And that while you are here, you are living in a foreign land. But you belong there. And one day you will return. And the church, meaning both our gathering here and the people that are gods, are like the foreign embassy. They give us a touch of heaven. They would walk in this building and we enter with, we meet with other Christians and we step back onto our home country in some real sense. And that together we are the ambassadors of God to a world that is longing for him. In a world that's longing for identity, we are those who are clear about ours. We are Christ's. We are citizens of a heavenly country. Listen to the way that the writer of the Hebrews describes the Christian later in the book. He describes you, us, as those who have been enlightened, whom light has come into, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and as ones who are looking for a city that is to come. We are holy brothers with a heavenly destiny and a heavenly assignment now aimed at that destiny. That is who you are. When everything else tells you you are something else. But that something else, a part of you, is more important than this. Remember this. Who you are is Christ's. Everything else comes after that. Secondly, the second big point here, he says, to consider Jesus the better Moses. Consider Jesus the better Moses. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of glory, more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses is faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over all God's house as a son. This transition from Jesus being better than the angels to better than Moses is taking us one step deeper into the heart of Hebrews, which is proclaiming that everything in the Old Testament was a shadow to Christ's reality. That everything was pointing forward to what was to come being Jesus. All the promises, all the prophecies, all the patterns were about Christ. The part we don't feel the shock of enough, or certainly as much as they felt it, was the idea that anyone could be better than Moses. When you became a Christian, unless you grew up Jewish, Christ was, was from the beginning, introduced to you as a central figure. So to look back at Moses, which you would do after Jesus, you would never think to make him higher than Jesus. Jesus, of course, is higher. But with a Jew, that is certainly not the case. As we're doing on Wednesday nights studying through the Old Testament, it's easy to see how Moses was the central, and is, by the way, the central figure in Judaism. More than anyone else, Moses is the main character of the Old Testament outside of God. He is the one who sets the people free in the central event of the Old Testament, which is the Exodus. He is the one who raises the staff over the Red Sea. He is the one who goes up Mount Sinai, receives the commands of God, brings them back down to the people. He is the one who is the mediator between God and man. He is the one who leads the people to the promised land. Moses is the one who is the primary author of the first five books of the Old Testament, which to the Jew are the most important books. Moses was the central theme for the Jew. And with that in mind, the writer of Hebrews says, and he was just a shadow. All he was was the thing pointing you forward to that which was most real, being Christ himself. This shock that Christ is better than Moses Christ being our apostle, just meaning the one sent to us. Christ being our high priest who offered the ultimate sacrifice. The reality is, and it seems odd to us now, but it certainly wasn't odd in the first century, when Judaism was a religion that was the most powerful in the world outside of Rome itself. The only religion Rome ever listened to would let them worship their gods, who were millions and millions strong. They were tempted in this early Christianity, when there were a few tens of thousands of Christians, to go back to Judaism. To the glory of the temple to the history of Judaism, all those things that they thought they were disconnecting from. The reason they were tempted to go back, tempted to leave, are few. They were tempted because of cultural acceptance. Right? At least we don't struggle with that one anymore. They were tempted because of status. Right? They were tempted because of avoiding hardship. They were tempted because of avoiding persecution. They were tempted to go back because that looked more impressive. 
all the same reasons we are tempted to leave today, if we are honest, that those who left have left, if we are honest. And the author is asking, why? The author is saying, those reasons to go back to Judaism aren't good enough reasons. <laughs> One of the most frustrating things about having children, along with the emotional volatility, one of the most frustrating things about children is when you ask them a question or why they did something, and they give you a reason that makes no sense at all. <laughs> That's a classic kid thing, and it's infuriating. Where you ask them, why did you do this? And they give you a reason, and you go, why, why is that a reason for what you just did? Now, here's, here's just a few real ones from my own life. Why don't you want to go to school? Because, because PE class is too far away from my classroom. Why, why don't you want to take a bath? Because the water will get dirty. Why, why, do you need, why do you need a piece of cake before bed? Because we haven't had second dessert yet. Why don't, why don't you want to go out to eat with the family? Because that place doesn't have tacos. Fair enough. This, this week, in fact, not one of my younger ones. Why did you let your friend cut your hair in the school bathroom? And he said, because how hard could it be? Turns out, by the way, very hard. <laughs> every night, every night, every night at about 2 a.m., I ask John, my one-year-old, why he won't go to sleep. And he responds very loudly and angrily. That's because he's tired. He's entirely unreasonable. Can't deal with him at all. The life of the parent very often is, that reason you're giving me is absurd. That reason you're giving me is not reasonable. That reason doesn't make any sense. It's the same idea here. The writer of Hebrews is saying, what do you mean you're going to go back to Judaism? So, so you can be more culturally accepted? So you can... Remove yourself from hardship and persecution, maybe for some financial prosperity. You're going to leave the Alpha and the Omega for that? You're going to leave the Christ who defeated death and defeated sin on your behalf for that? You're going to leave the creator of all things, the artist of the universe and the cosmos? You're going to leave him because your life's a little more difficult being a Christian? Those reasons aren't good enough. Often is the thesis of the book of Hebrews. To leave the one that by whom and for whom all things were made. Transitioning into our into our final points, I, I do want you to see a little more clearly that Moses, though he didn't know it, was pointing us forward to Christ in all sorts of ways. For instance, born in a lowly position, to a humble family, but made royalty. Which, which, which one's which one's that about? Or born at a time of genocide when the king had decreed that all male babies must be killed. Which which one? It's, they're all both, by the way. Next one. Shortly after birth, being brought to the heart of Egypt. Or, before beginning his ministry, goes into the wilderness for a time of preparation of 40. Moses for 40 years, Jesus for 40 days. Sent by God to deliver God's people from slavery. Performs miracles to establish his credibility. God's mouthpiece to his people. The mediator who'd be the go-between between the people and God. Informs God's people about the way to live, given the law, after being set free. Had an intimate relationship with God different than anybody else. Face shone with the glory of God as he came down the mountain of the transfiguration. Truly loved God's people beyond understanding. The reality is, again, as we're looking at on Wednesday nights, is the entire Old Testament is like this. Where you say, oh, that's, that's telling us about Jesus, actually. Like, oh, that's actually pointing us forward to Christ. Christ himself says, on the road to Emmaus, everything that Moses wrote, <laughs> everything in the prophets and the uh, priests is about Jesus. <coughs> and Hebrews is pointing us to this reality, showing how all these Old Testament stories are really just shadows of the thing which is most real. Moses, as great as he was, was a shadow being cast by Christ. Whereas Moses was adopted into royalty, Christ was royal from the start. Moses delivered the people from slavery. Christ delivered the people from the sin that was the actual problem. Moses was a mouthpiece of God. Jesus was God's final and ultimate and clearest word. Moses went back and forth from God to the people. Jesus, once and for all, brought the people back to God. Moses set up a law to follow. Jesus gave people hearts that would follow. Moses knew God a little. Jesus was God completely. Moses' face shone for a moment. Christ, every moment, needed flesh to veil his infinite glory. Moses took the people to the outskirts of an earthly promised land. Jesus brings us himself into an er eternal, heavenly kingdom. Moses was a servant. Jesus was a son. The final parallel, as you see, is in our last 
main point of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, which is this, that Christ is faithful over us claimers. That Christ is faithful over us claimers. Verse 6, Christ is faithful over God's house as his son. This is still about paralleling him to Moses. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. That The idea of clinging is from this word, hold fast, which is a common one in the New Testament. That we are to hold fast to the gospel, hold fast to Christ. The final parallel here between Moses and Jesus may be the most beautiful one. You may have never noticed before, just kind of read through it if you've read through the Old Testament, but in the middle of all the mistakes the Israelites make, in the middle of all of their rebellion and all of their failures and all of their poor theology and poor practice, God repeatedly offered to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and start over with Moses. Do you know that? It happened several times. Where God said, let's just kill all of them, and then we'll start with you as a new nation. For instance, one of them, Exodus 32, verses 9 and 10. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. Several times this happens. And listen, as you're reading the Old Testament, and you come to this, you go, yeah, that makes sense. These people are terrible. These people are faithless. These people will not just trust God. These people have seen these great works of God and still turn to idols, still turn to women, still turn to other things. It makes sense. Let's clear the slate, try again. So the question is, why doesn't God do it? He's obviously prepared to do so. What is it that makes him not do it? The reason is because in each case, in everyone, Moses was faithful to the people. In each case, Moses stood up in front of God and begged God to forgive them. He gave up his opportunity to be the father of a nation and instead stood for the difficult, mistake-riddled, frustrating people of God. The next verse. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Turn from your anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore. And the Lord relented. The Psalms even sung about this. Psalm 106. Therefore God said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach to turn away his wrath from destroying them. God's wrath burned against an unholy, unworthy people. So Moses stood in the gap and begged for their forgiveness. Not because they were worthy. He knew they weren't worthy. But because of God's goodness. And because of his faithfulness to the people. You'll have, you'll have to lay it out. I think it's clear enough. This is Jesus. Who looks at you and me. And doesn't say, I think they're good enough. But sees that you're not good enough. Sees that we are faithless and our hearts are idol factories, just pumping them out. And that we constantly turn to other things and have to be brought back by the church and by himself to his way. Sees that we are failures, that we haven't got our theology exactly right, that we certainly haven't got our practice exactly right. And sees and knows that God's wrath is rightful, rightfully burning against his people. And so Christ as the ultimate and final, the reality of the shadow of Moses stands. Christ being faithful to you. Verse 6. Faithful over God's house of the Son. Better than Moses. Better than Moses, when you are sinful, when you fail, Moses stood up and begged God to forgive the people. Christ, Christ stands up on pierced feet, with pierced hands, to show the Father, not begging Him to forgive you, but reminding the Father that you are forgiven already. Mm, where's Jacob will cut you when you need him? Amen. <laughs> reminding the Father, not that you could be forgiven, but as we sang a moment ago, that it's finished. That despite the fact that you are still here today, and you still make mistakes, and you still sin, and you still fail, 
and you still haven't got your theology right. That Christ's work was utterly done so that he could say without any bit of deception, it is finished, the battle is over. Christ, the better Moses, stands in the breach between us and God and drinks the wrath of God himself. Oh. <coughs> Second Timothy chapter 2 says, if we are faithless, Jesus remains faithful. When we are faithless, Christ remains faithful. 2 Thessalonians 3, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold fast, same word, cling, the confession of our hope, the gospel without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Here we have the, the same idea and the same Greek word, that hold fast idea, because Christ is faithful. Here's the final idea. Charles Spurgeon once gave an illustration about what faith is that has become famous because it's great. He says, faith is like the life of the limpet. And the limpet are these, these little creatures that live on the on the rocks in the shore. Right? The waves are crashing on the rocks and they will grasp onto one of these rocks and they will live there forever. And as long as they're on the rock, they are safe. And, and they're suction so hard to the rock that you, you can't get it off. The scientists have studied what it is that they are using to keep them so strongly attached to the rock. That so often the life of the limpet is the life of the Christian. It's not all that impressive. We're not doing all that much. You look at us and don't even see us. But we cling. We hold fast to the one thing in our life that is immovable. That amidst the waves, after waves, after waves, as I feel like I am drowning and being washed underneath, that everything is against me, that the rock will not move. And so by just clinging to the rock, I make myself immovable. By just holding on to the rock. He's, Spurgeon said this, Our little friend, the limpet, doesn't know much, but he clings. He's not acquainted with the geological formation of the rock, but he clings. He can cling, and he has found something to cling to. This is all his stock of knowledge, and he uses it for his security and salvation. It is the limpet's life to cling to the rock, and it's the sinner's life to cling to Jesus. Dear Christian, if you, if you cling, you are safe, no matter what. No matter the waves, no matter the strength of the storm, you are safe if you claim. But the author of Hebrews is clear. If you do not cling to Jesus, not if you make mistakes, not if you aren't perfect, not if you don't understand things perfectly, but if you do not cling to Jesus, you will not be saved. No matter how good your baptism was, no matter how good your prayer was at the beginning, if there is no cling to Christ, there will be no salvation in the end. There's almost certainly a reference here to the parable of the sower that Jesus tells. In the parable of the sower, there is one of the seeds that falls on a rocky ground. In the beginning, it sprouts up quickly. But in the end, it dies because of the rocks. And Jesus says that this is the one who, at the beginning of faith, it sprouts up with excitement. But because he has no root, is killed by the cares of the world, by the pains and struggles of the world that we're all going to feel, that the mistakes that the seed itself makes very often, that those things keep them from clinging. And this is precisely what our author fears may happen with his readers, that they'll grab but not cling. The parable, Luke 8, 15, ends like this. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold fast. Same Greek. Cling in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. But Christ is faithful over God's house of his Son. And we're his house, if indeed we cling, if indeed we hold fast to the gospel, hold fast to our confidence, our boasting, and our hope, hold fast to Jesus. Jesus is faithful to all those who cling. So what do you need to do? Cling. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to do everything right, but you must cling to Jesus. You don't have to be strong to cling. In fact, it's often easier when you're weak. The rock is strong for both of you. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Same word being used here. 
Paul says that we are as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet, same, this, same word in the whole thing. As having nothing, but yet clinging to everything. As having nothing, but holding on to everything. The beauty, of course, is this. That when you let go of everything else in the world with your hands, so that you may cling on to Christ, you have given up nothing, and you have gained everything. And that as long as you have Christ, and as long as you cling to Christ, everything is yours. We are holy brothers. That is who you are at God. No matter how you are today on Sunday, how you were this morning, how you were this week, you are Christ. You have been given a heavenly calling because you are a citizen from somewhere else and are here on the mission from the one who runs that place. You have found yourself this morning in the embassy of that foreign nation. Consider Jesus the better Moses. Where Moses stood in the gap, Jesus actually paid the price. Not just begging God to forgive, but forgiving you once and for all. And that all that's required of us is to cling on to Christ, the rock. And that as Moses was faithful, so too is Christ faithful. If you have any spiritual need this morning, if you do not know this Christ yet, and I bow to him, we will baptize you today before we leave. We can help you at all in your journey to Christ as we walk together as we being made strong.